author Beth Miller rejoins us to tell us more about her new book, What Loss Can Teach Us, A Sacred Pathway to Growth and Healing, today on the Faithful and True Podcast. Welcome to the Faithful and True Podcast. We're happy to be with you again today. And Greg, I don't know how you did it, but you were able to (laughs) convince your wife, Beth Miller, to come back and join us for a second podcast about the exciting news about the release of her first ever book, which is called What Loss Can Teach Us. And uh, we got off to a great start with our last podcast, and we're happy to have Beth back with us again Thanks. today. It's really good to be here. Yeah, um, for those of you that were here last time or you're just joining us, um, we did talk about the book. And as the title implies, it does talk about um, grief. And um, I mentioned this saying that I was introduced to, that anytime there's loss, there's grief. Mm-hmm. And the greater the loss, the greater the grief. And um, one of the things you alluded to, Beth, was that you do re- reference our story. Um, you talk a little bit about the betrayal and the chaos that that created. But I also know that the book is more than is about more than just that. It's about any kind of loss. Yeah. So, what are some of the losses that you reference in the book itself? Yeah. Well, I wanted to, you know, like you're saying, just really enlarge this to invite anyone who's experienced loss, which is all of us, right? Mm-hmm, right. Um, to consider what it is that they, um, like the wisdom that that loss could offer. And so some of the different stories in there refer to people that have known a house fire, a miscarriage, the premature death of um, teenage or adult children, um, divorce, uh pain with parents. Um, There are three or four stories in there of adults who have been doing really good deep work and recognizing the need to grieve and tend to their wounds from childhood, some of their family of origin work as Mm -hmm. we refer to it. Um, The other thing that I reference is the pandemic and that we have all known losses Um, throughout this last year. Mm -hmm. And um, so there's a variety of things that are mentioned. And and the the pandemic is a great example of kind of the continuum of loss, where at one end of the continuum is the loss of gathering socially or being able to uphold Christmas traditions all the way to the loss of life that people have experienced and that families are, are suffering through. And so one of the things that we recognize is that our response to the loss is going to be different depending upon the nature of the loss. And all loss needs to be acknowledged and, and um, mm-hmm. referenced in our, our moving forward. Right. It's almost as if no loss can completely be left behind. That if we don't acknowledge it, we'll continue to carry it forward. Yeah. Well, I, I know that there's a variety of different um, topics that you address or chapters. And so um, one of the things that we talk a lot about here is the role of God in our life. And so many of us um, have a perception of God that if God is good, then my life will be easy. And if God is, or if I am good, Mm -hmm. my life will be easy. And you have this great image of the role that God can be in our life. So if you wouldn't mind just talking a little bit about that imagery. Right. Well, um, again, I as we referenced in the first podcast, I love authors and I love quotes. Mm -hmm. And so yet another example of that is a great quote by author Sue Monk Kidd, who said, how did we ever get the idea that God is merely a rescuer and not a midwife? Well, that just landed in me in such a significant place. Because I do think that it's much easier to think about God as our rescuer. And we can look at various scriptures that would lead us to think that. However, what's also true is that we don't tend to want to look at Jesus's words um, such, you know, that would say that isn't the full story, such as in this world, you will have trouble. And 
the way that, you know, Sue Monk Kidd worded this was so significant for me that I decided to write a chapter about what does this mean for us to consider God as our midwife? And several years ago, I had the absolute privilege of being at the hospital the night that one of my dearest friends was giving birth. And she had, uh, at this point, she was about 10 days late. Um, her little girl was nowhere, <laughs> you know, in a hurry, no way in a hurry. And there was uh, a midwife that had journeyed with my friend through, you know, her whole pregnancy and, of course, was there with us that night, which was Christmas Eve, actually. And I watched as the midwife, Glenda, um, knew how to encourage my friend, um, when to tell her to rest, when to tell her to push. Um, She was literally journeying with her to help her bring new life into the world and she could not do it for her. And that image is powerful when we think that, um, yes, there are times that God rescues and protects us, maybe more than we even can know. And I think there are many, many other times that God is inviting us to say, there is something I want to do in you here. There is something new that I want to birth in you. And I'll walk you through that. I'll help you navigate that. And you you have to lean in and do your part. Right. Well, and the image is powerful because whether God is a rescuer at times or God is a midwife, God is present. Yeah. And that's the piece that we find comfort is knowing that whatever it is that we're going through, what, whatever God's activity or role is in our life, that we are not alone, that God is with us in the midst of the chaos and the pain. Right. How, how did that understanding or that image kind of redefine the way that you see your own journey and your own story? Mm. Well, you know, in my own experience and the losses that I've faced in life, I think I did have to wrestle with, um, God, where are you? And You know, I'm so thankful that, um, and I really believe this is, you know, holy timing. Um, Soon before our story unfolded, I was reading David Benner's book called Sacred Companions. And in there, he points to the question of, God, where are you? And a lot of times we ask that question with a fist raised, mm-hmm. right? Um, and and that's, that's okay. I, I would say I think that our good and loving God knows if we're feeling that way, so it's good to turn towards God if right. we're struggling, mm-hmm. right? And if we need to <clears throat> rail against heaven, do it. What's also true is eventually I think that leads us into... It's the same words, but it's altogether different to ask, God, where are you? Mm -hmm. And then we begin to soften into looking and listening for the many different ways, right, that God is showing up and present with us. And I think one of the things that loss can teach us is that there's probably a pretty good chance that our image of God isn't accurate. And... The scriptures tell us that we will see dimly, you know, and it will be a while before we see clearly. But hopefully, loss can invite us to see a little more clearly of who God is and who it is that God is inviting us to be in the process. Well, and it it also gets to our expectations around God. Um, For many of us, we are frustrated, disappointed, hurt, angry, because God isn't meeting our expectations. God doesn't show up in that timely way. It's the question of Lazarus' sisters when they see Jesus, you know, if only you had been here, Mm -hmm. our brother would not have died. And implied in that is, where were you? Why weren't you here? Exactly. And so understanding this idea of our, our relationship with God in some way is informed by our expectations And if we want to change our relationship, we must be willing to evaluate Mm -hmm. and explore those expectations. And I love that, you know, that we can either have the raised fist, where are you, God, which is valid and real and Mm -hmm. feels very prophetic. 
And we can also have the where are you, God, that is an invitation. And it's an invitation for God to be with us where we are. But it's also the invitation for us to be open to whatever it is that God is doing. Mm -hmm. I heard someone say recently, and and I just love this, that she had to wrestle with um, whether or not she could trust God because she had a very certain view of what that would look like, of how God would come through for her, and yet some really painful things had happened. And so the question that she began to shift and ask instead was not, can I trust you, God, but what is it that I can trust you for? Mm -hmm. Right, because she had only defined it as God is rescuer. Right. And she was learning and softening into this holy surrender of maybe there are other things, God, that I can trust you for that are good in this. Well, and um, obviously I've never given birth. And (laughs) rumor has it, it is painful. Yes. And so I think that that's another factor in this imagery is that um, in the, the giving to a, a birth to new life, as we're going through that process, as God is midwife with us, that there is pain in that process. Mm-hmm. And sometimes we want new life without the pain of the death that brings the hope of resurrection. Right. But this imagery reminds us that God can be loving and we can be in pain. But if our belief is, if God is loving, I will not be in pain, and we are in pain, suddenly that says something about God. So it is expanding the sense of who God is and how God can be with us. Absolutely. And that pain, if there's going to be new life, unless there's really strong drugs, pain is going to be a part of it. (laughs) Yeah, I I think we can count on that. Okay. Um, I know that another um, topic, uh, an approach to this idea of loss that you talk about is anger. And you Mm. even talk about this idea of clean anger. And most of us, I guess, are, you know, familiar with messy anger and the chaos (laughs) that that creates. So just tell us a little bit about clean anger. Well, I I think anger gets a lot of bad press. Mm -hmm. And it's understandable. We are really messy in our anger, right? And that's chaotic. There can be a lot of damage done Mm -hmm. in unhealthy anger. In clean anger, however, I think transformation can happen. And, you know, I think of the scripture that says, be angry and do not sin in your anger. Well, you know, growing up, I think the thing that I heard in, particularly in Christian circles, was way more on the emphasis of, and do not sin in your anger. Well, I didn't have a clue how to be really healthily angry and not sin in that, you know, using that, that language. So part of what my journey has taken me on, no matter what the loss has been, has been exploring what does it look like to lean into anger in ways that are formative, that are clean. And some of the things that I would say, you know, that looks like is being direct, um, like really it takes a strong sense of self to come out from behind, I'm frustrated, or being nagging, or uh, being passive aggressive, um, or no, no, I'm not really mad, you know. Right. It's actually really vulnerable to come out from behind all of that and say, yeah, I am feeling anger. I am angry. Um, to be uh, clean in terms of you know, no name calling, um, being kind even. So we're not being contemptuous towards the other person. Um, another part of clean anger is actually allowing yourself to feel the anger that's there rather than hiding behind that to avoid feeling grief. Right. Right. Um, another piece of it is if I'm going to be clean in my anger, then I am willing to look at all that that's connecting to. So, for example, if I'm having, um, you know, like we often use the phrase, an $80 reaction to a, you know, $40 issue or something, I got to get in there and wrestle with the other $40, right? I got to look at what's getting stirred up in me and is this 
pressing on some old history. One of the stories that I tell in the chapter of Clean Anger, um, with her permission, is about a beautiful woman who was doing um, some really good work in her marriage and continued to, um, even though her husband was also doing good work, every now and then would refer to him as the betrayer. And this was three, four, sometimes on even into five years into their recovery. And, and that's true. That definition was accurate. Right. And um, it's, you know, my sense was that it had more to do with something going on in her than actually a description of him. So one day in group, she began to wrestle with that. And someone said, can you talk a little bit about the first time you were betrayed? Like, what's underneath this? And I'll never forget, she closed her eyes and um, pretty instantly began to cry, but yet very articu articulately described what happened the first time she was betrayed. She was a young girl in junior high school. Uh, just about a year before this event happened, her dad had left, remarried someone else, and had kind of, you know, uh, enveloped that other family that, his new wife had children. Well, that night, she was cheering at her basketball game, and her dad walked in with his new wife to cheer on his stepson, barely waved at her from across the gym, and then left. And there, you know, right underneath that, that present-day anger, right, mm -hmm. was the historic anger. And that's where she began to be um, really clean in her anger. It didn't by any means dismiss the pain that she had experienced in her marriage, and she was willing to go after that historic layer. Right. Well, one, one thing about anger, I, I often talk about emotions, and some emotions reduce our energy, and some emotions produce energy. And anger, obviously, the way the neurochemistry works, produces energy. And what we do with that energy, in fact, Anger actually can be a catalyst for change. And it's about mm -hmm. stewarding that energy and um, understanding if I'm angry about something, what do I want to change? Uh, it's, it's that righteous anger. If there's an injustice, if there's a, a pattern of hurt, if there's mm -hmm. a lack of boundaries, then I can take the anger and the energy that's being produced and in a clean way, bring about the change I'm needing. And I also think a part of it, and you, you alluded to this, is... If I'm blaming everyone else for my anger, then I'm not owning it. Right. And if I don't own it, I can't steward it. Right. And it's that shift that is many times dramatic where it becomes not you make me angry, but mm -hmm. is I am angry about this, and then I get to determine what I'm going to do with that oh, anger. Ownership is incredibly freeing, and it really brings about, um, I think it brings traction. Mm -hmm. I think we gain movement. You know, because the idea is not to stay in anger, you know, right. by any means. Like, we want to move through it. It's, it's the tunnel image. Um, and ownership helps us to gain some of that traction. And what's true is in our own marriage, we had to find our anger and express it in clean and safe ways. And right. neither one of us came from families that modeled this um, in the best way. And so we've had to learn to do that so that we can be safe and be angry. Yeah, um, And I think that that's one of the things that has really served us in developing intimacy is that we've not shied away from the anger. We've mm -hmm. not always done it well. And we've tried to do it in more of a redemptive way that leads to the intimacy that can be on the other side. Yeah. Well, I, I remember one of the first times that we had uh, what I would consider, you know, a healthier or healthy-ish, you know. <laughs> Healthy light. <laughs> right. Much less bloodshed. <laughs> right, yeah. right. A, you know, a different kind of argument, and it actually created intimacy, mm -hmm. as you're saying. And I think we both caught a glimpse of, oh, this is good. This is different, right. you know. Well, one, for those of us that um, are familiar with this field and, um, understand these issues, you're not going to be surprised that there's a, a chapter about shame. Hmm. And specifically, though, the, the role that shame and grief can play. And um, I often refer to shame as a shape shifter, and it, it can adapt to an environment. 
and almost get lost in the background. And shame can show up in our grief. And so what are some of the the things that you want the reader to understand about the relationship between shame and grief? Yeah. Well, um, I'll start by telling a story. So the name of this chapter is called Take Off That Ugly Sweater. And um, just a couple of months after our own crash and burn, I was having breakfast with a friend, and I was, you know, kind of explaining some of my experiences. Um, Our story had uh, unfolded at a very large church where you were no longer on staff, but I was um, as the primary breadwinner then, and so that was chaotic, you know, trying to navigate that. So as I was telling her some of, you know, my chaotic conversations in the church hallways and so forth, she just sat back in the booth, and I'll never forget this. She just looked at me, and she said, girl, you got to take off that ugly sweater. You are all wrapped up in shame. And, you know, thank God for people who tell us the truth in love. Absolutely. Right. And I was cloaked in shame, and I didn't even realize it. And... You know, the reasons that we can feel shame in our grief are immense. You know, we can feel shame because we feel like we missed something or we should have made a different decision. Um, We can feel shame about, um, you know, when, when we enlarge the circle of the kind of losses that we're talking about here. We can feel shame because... um, we are frustrated with a loved one who's sick. We can feel shame because we didn't get to say goodbye. We can feel shame because um, we think uh, we could have prevented something, particularly I've noticed when it comes to our children. Right. I think as parents, we are hardwired to believe we can protect them. And so shame really can slip in there or or come crashing down right. on us. Well, it's that whole category of the woulda, coulda, shoulda shame. Right. And grief, because it's about loss, connects us to all that list of things that we wish that we had done differently, either to prevent the loss or not to be blindsided by the loss or to be able to maybe engage the loss in a more redemptive way. Yeah. Well, you know, I... I am so aware of how just profound shame can be. And um, I I had the opportunities, I was writing this chapter in particular, to read, uh, there's so much good stuff out there now. I think we are becoming more shame literate, as, you know, especially in the therapeutic community. And so understanding that shame shows up as that voice um, that tells us we're not enough. Um, Kurt Thompson has a great definition of shame where he defines it as um, believing we don't have what it takes to tolerate a situation or to face a circumstance. And I think all of us can relate to that in, you know, internal feeling of, oh, I, I don't know if I can do this. And um, there's just lots of of, again, grief and shame are two of the things we want to avoid the most. So this is the deep end of the pool. Right, when they combine together. Right, when they Mm -hmm. combine together, I just want to say, like, we're swimming in the deep end, and shame hates to be spoken out loud. Right. And when we can start to recognize the way that shame storms find us, the way that the lies of shame... Um, kind of engulf us, whether it's in the form of a storm or it's a little more subtle, like a gas that kind of seeps under the door. Um, it finds us one way or the other. And I absolutely believe that one of the things loss can teach us is how to recognize it, how to see it more, and then begin to enter into, as you know, Brene Brown talks about, shame resilience. Right. Well, as, as our time comes to an end, Um, There's a beautiful uh, passage that you've written that incorporates um, Jesus and those who may be struggling with um, shame. And I was just wondering if you would be willing to read that for us. I would love to. So um, 
Throughout the Gospels, we do see Jesus repeat this pattern of learning or inviting various people that he encounters to shed shame. And so um, some of these are Jesus's words, and some of these are mine, and my guess is you can figure out which is which. (laughs) You guys are great writing partners. (laughs) (laughs) So this is what I imagine. To the woman who had been bleeding for 12 years, daughter, Jesus said, your faith has made you well, go in peace. You are important enough for me to stop and notice as I make my way to a sick little girl. Don't believe that your illness counts you out or makes you damaged goods. I'm glad you touched me. Take off that ugly sweater. To Zacchaeus, I'm coming to spend time with you in your home. You too are a son of Abraham. Don't believe the lie that your poor choices or your physical stature make you unlovable. Take off that ugly sweater. To the woman caught in adultery, Jesus called out the truth of those wanting to stone her and trap him. I I do not condemn you. Leave your life of sin. No one is blameless, including those men who wanted to stone you. Your life is worth saving, and you have the chance to make other choices. Your worth is not found in what you can offer someone sexually. Take off that ugly sweater. To the woman crippled for 18 years, Jesus called her forward in the synagogue, out from where women had to be separated from men, touching her, healing her on the Sabbath. Woman, you were set free. You too are a daughter of Abraham. You and your healing are more important than the law, so much so that I'm willing to break it on your behalf. Don't believe the lie that you don't matter or that your body or your womanhood is something to be ashamed of. Take off that ugly sweater. And to Peter, do you love me? Then feed my sheep. I forgive your betrayal, and your choice to deny me doesn't invalidate your capacity to lead. Take off that ugly sweater. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Beth, for coming back and joining us again today, squeezing us into your hectic (laughs) schedule. Yes, and if I could just say one final thing, if that would be okay. Of course, of course. I specifically want to say thank you to Greg. And you have been so supportive of me in this process. And uh, I just want to say you are a good man. And I am so grateful for your support and encouragement as I've written this book, so much that includes our story, and uh, inviting me here today to talk about it. Thank you. Well, thank you. And I am grateful to be included and to be a part of this journey. So thank you. Um, For those of you, and we're assuming all of you now are interested, um, you can (laughs) buy the book um, and go on Amazon, or you can go to the publisher, publisher, um, upperroombooks.com, and be able to get this. And soon, we'll also have it available here through the Faithful and True Bookstore. We can hardly wait. Yeah. So thank you for being with us, Beth. Thanks. It's been a pleasure. Thanks again, Beth. It was our pleasure pleasure to be able to uh, jumpstart the world knowing about Uh, what loss can teach us. Uh, We thank our watchers, our listeners, our loyal viewers uh, for joining us again today on the Faithful and True Podcast. We ask that you would uh, visit our YouTube channel, which is Faithful and True Channel, and uh, subscribe and like our episodes if you would, and listen to the audio versions uh, as you travel in the car as well. Uh, Until we join you again next week, we hope that this coming week for you is going to be a week that's filled with many blessings and great vision.